Hello, my name is Su Wook Lee. Uh, today I'd like to share about some physics ideas behind mathematics. Sometimes I look at a question and then see where does the where does those formulas coming from? Or sometimes you, you might wonder, are they talking about those uh, projectile motions or the heat uh, cooling or heating? Are they for real? Well, it's very confusing. So what I wanted what I wanted to share was uh, share a little bit of light from physics perspective about those math equations that we see from our math problems. So now first, what we like to do is we like to look at uh, something called projectile motion. So you've probably seen questions like these, where a ball is thrown uh, into the air, uh, as you can see, uh, something like this. And many times these are the questions of the quadratic functions. And we see them from algebra 1, algebra 2, or calculus. For example, in this question that you see on your uh, right hand screen, a ball is thrown into the air uh, from uh, from the edge of the 48 foot high cliff so that it eventually lands on the uh, lands on the ground. So this question is actually from June 2014 algebra 1 exam. Now what I wanted to see is that is this graph actually uh, feasible or is it something uh, from out of this world? <laughs> so we like to look at them together a little bit. But before we do that, uh, I want to see uh, some ideas about the projectile motions first. Background. Uh, we know that the uh, from calculus, uh, position is in fact equal to one half a t square uh, plus initial velocity over here, and then uh, times time and also uh, initial position. So that's the kind of concept that we have seen a lot from calculus classes. Of course, here. Uh, S double prime is equal to where S being the position is the acceleration over here and then the first derivative being the velocity so uh, and then we know that velocity can be expressed as the acceleration times time uh, plus the uh, initial value here now but in physics uh, reference sheet uh, we will see something like this uh, on the on the formula, there is no mention of the um, no mention of the in initial position, but uh, we can see that idea that uh, presented in physics is about the same as the idea which we're talking about in calculus class. Now, then in this case, uh, let's try to look at some uh, examples of the projectile motions. When we look at the projectile motions, this is a graph of the path of the uh, uh, projecting uh, uh, project uh, projected. Uh, object here. So notice that this horizontal axis is the uh, x-axis, meaning horizontal distances, and vertical is y. And then you might wonder, yeah, of course it has to be like that. But in fact, this uh, gives us nice picture of a projectile motion here. Because when, when an object starts from, uh, from this location, and when it's shooting up this way, in fact, it has two components. One component uh, that's going up that's why an object is moving up a little bit and then coming back down. And then uh, an object that's go going up and down, in fact, is governed by the gravity. On the other hand, horizontally speaking, this horizontal component of the velocity will not experience gravity. I mean, given that we're going to neglect the uh, air resistance of uh, or many, uh, many other minor uh, uh, impact that we may see, but we're going to uh, we're going to ignore that for now. Then what's going to be happening is this horizontal velocity will not experience anything in terms of gravity. So we have two kinds of motions happening: one vertical with gravity, one horizontal. And in math class, uh, we 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 many times see the function vertical position versus time, not necessarily vertical position versus the horizontal position. As you can see over here, this function is the horizontal position versus the vertical position. But many times it is somewhat confusing. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to compare these two uh, functions a little bit and then to see the similarities and then uh, to see the differences. So first for the given condition here we have uh, Gravitational acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second square. And let's assume uh, that we have a little boy here <laughs> uh, throwing a ball up on the air and then coming back down in both cases. 
And in both cases, we're going to assume uh, that the vertical velocity is 19.6 meters per second. Simply, this is double of the negative 9.8. This is regarding the sine, of course. So what this one does is that after two seconds, ball will stop instantaneously uh, or reaching the maximum position. Now, in the first case, we're going to assume that the uh, horizontal uh, velocity is one meter uh, per second square uh, per second. So you, as you can see, it's not going to go that far to the right. On the other hand, a second picture, uh, even though it has same vertical velocity, the horizontal velocity is five meters per second. So it's going to go farther out. Now, then in this case, one thing that uh, which we get to realize is this: first, let us assume about the uh, uh, let us talk about the hard, uh, height versus time graph. Height versus time graph would have given in this way. E equation would be given in this way. Uh, in this way, and when you sketch this one onto the horizontal axis being the time, and vertical axis being the uh, height, then we will see a picture that looks like this. Now, as you can see. This picture is true for either number one or number two condition. Either way, both of them will share same uh, height versus time graph. Yes, that's right. No matter how it is thrown, as long as the vertical uh, velocity is the same, a vertical initial velocity is the same, then we get to have same kind of height versus uh, time uh, graph. Notice that this uh, orange color graph is not the path of the ball because obviously as you can see these two uh, uh, balls will uh, you know travel in different locations on the other hand when you look at the second uh, graphs here for the first one if horizontal velocity is one meter per second in that case, you will see that height versus the horizontal displacement will have the exactly same uh, graph as the height versus time. Because every second, essentially, uh, the ball will move to the uh, ball will move horizontally one meter. So in fact, one second from the time being equivalent to one meter on the horizontal distance. So as you can see, it's going to be uh, pretty much identical uh, looking graph. And then uh, from the equational, equational as well, essentially t is equal to x, and then we will see uh, exactly the same uh, equation. So in case, of the first, uh, in, the, in, in case of the first picture, when the horizontal uh, velocity is just, uh, one meter per second, in that case, we get to see that this graph but that many times we see from the uh, height versus time is the, in fact, path of the ball as well. But on the other hand, what if uh, horizontal uh, velocity is 5 meters per second? You see, then uh, what we end up getting is this will be the equation. You can see that quite easily. Now, <laughs> uh, and if you to sketch this one, we end up having a graph that's a bit more wide open. And of course, yeah, this has been stretched horizontally by the factor of five. So, uh, in this case, the path of the ball, even though it goes a bit wider, but at the same time, we, we can see the highest uh, location is the same in regardless any kind of graph, but the, uh, it's a bit wider, but yet horizontal versus time for second case will still be this. Uh, picture. Now, so given this one, let's try to look at a few uh, examples that we see from the reasons exam. So I have collected some questions uh, from Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and uh, Geometry. Uh, mostly Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. Uh, where do they talk about projectile motions? So according to the Common Core, it talks about it at the uh, Algebra 1 exams a lot. So for this uh, first question that I uh, shared with you earlier, 
Number nine, uh, from June 2014, Algebra 1. Uh, I was able to notice a few points here out of, you know, some, uh, so we, I was able to identify 0, comma, uh, 48 was the initial position. And then it did mention that a 48 foot will be the uh, initial location as well. And then 1, comma, 112 seems to be uh, the second point where the uh, ball is passing through. And then seemingly, uh, 2, comma, 144 was the another point where the ball is passing through as well. Now, so I use these three points to calculate the quadratic equation. And notice that the other uh, points here also satisfy exact uh, symmetry about uh, uh, x equals 2.5 as well here. When, when, when I have done that, uh, I realized the equation of this parabola was this. And as you can see over here, this actually matches exactly uh, what the question was describing. Where initial position was 48. It did not mention about the initial velocity. But you can still negative 16 actually makes sense because negative 16 will be half of 32, which is the 32.2 uh, 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 approximately, is the... Uh, uh, gravitational acceleration in feet per second. So, as you talked about it earlier here, the coefficient of the t or the time was the initial velocity, and coefficient of the t squared was the half of the acceleration. And you can see that in this question number nine, it was quite reasonable uh, because. Uh, Yes, indeed, the acceleration was 32 uh, feet per second, which is true. Uh, and then uh, initial velocity, uh, vertical uh, velocity was uh, 80 feet per second, which is also uh, you know, feasible. So therefore, uh, this question is very realistic. And then it was actually you know, pretty well, well uh, written question as well. Now, so let's look at the next question here. How about a number 36 from January 2017, also from Algebra 1? Now, uh, interestingly, in this case, uh, Alex launched a ball into the air, and then height of the ball can be represented by the equation that's given here. So uh, I'm not sure if you can see, uh, question, the equation was, h equals negative 8 t squared plus 40 t plus 5. Now, then we realize that initial location is height of 5, so whatever that might have been, because it says height is unit, so I don't know which unit it is, but, you know, it's 5. Okay, it can be 5 feet, 5 meters, you know. Uh, and then uh, initial velocity is 40, so it can be 40 feet per second, 40 meters per second, or, or it can be any other kind of things for that matter. But the interesting thing here was this, negative uh, uh, 80 squared. So <laughs> based upon uh, uh, projectile motions that we know from physics class, if you have the leading coefficient of uh, leading coefficient to be negative 8, that tells us that acceleration is... Uh, 16 uh, units uh, per second square, or it depends upon the direction that which we are looking at. So, okay, so 16 units per second square. So I was quite curious, would, would 16, does, it's not 16, it cannot be 16 meters per second square on the earth that we live in, nor uh, 32 feet per second square either. So I was looking through uh, different uh, planets, at least, at least in solar system, and then I wasn't able to find <laughs> any, uh, a planet uh, that has uh, possibly 16 uh, uh, units per second square. Uh, depends upon you know how you look at it. It has to be 1.6 g compared to the Earth gravity, or 0.5 g, uh, depending upon you know feet. Uh, and none of them, uh, nothing on the uh, what you call it, uh, uh, planet, uh, solar plant, uh, solar system uh, had that kind of you know gravity. Uh, from what I uh, try to find it. So, in fact, this is truly a question out of this world, <laughs> you know, <laughs> many different ways. Uh, and then he was asking for different kind of things, but you can see that this, I mean, for, from math 
uh, calculation perspective, it didn't make that much of differences. Uh, but from physics pers perspective, it was quite interesting uh, because where do you find this planet? Or it could have been totally under new unit uh, that uh, uh, this uh, it was created under. Yes. But so it was somewhat interesting to see that uh, from this question. All right. So how about uh, uh, next question here? So this one is from August 2016, Algebra 1. And uh, height of the rocket uh, is at, at selected uh, times is shown in the table below. So here, uh, uh, you can see that uh, over here, uh, so zero and then uh, zero and uh, one eighty, and then one second after that is two sixty. Two seconds after that is 308. And th these are all in terms of feet. So, and then uh, three, uh, uh, after three seconds, it went up to 324 and so forth and so on, which was, you know, so I was curious, what uh, does this actually satisfy uh, the projectile motion that we know of in this, you know, from physics? So I was looking, I was, you know, uh, basically uh, doing the quadratic regression and then it came out exactly, this was the equation h of t was equal to negative 16 t squared plus 96 t plus 180. Now, uh, so then, I mean, this equation in itself was, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, initial location, initial uh, height was 180. Uh, and then uh, initial velocity was 96. So when, when it was, uh, when it was, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, when time was equal to zero, it had a velocity of 96 feet per second. And then, yes, gravity is uh, constant acceleration all throughout all time. So that means uh, constant, constant, constant acceleration of 32 feet per second squared. So we see that this was a, a nice projectile motion. Uh, because, a con because of the constant acceleration, we realize that there is no more uh, force uh, pushing the rocket at or after time t was equal to zero because um, only acceleration uh, that we saw was 32 feet per second squared which was constant gravitational acceleration so therefore uh, it seems to be quite feasible but in the, in the question it says based upon these data which statement is not valid uh, not a valid conclusion so now let's look at the first one rocket was launched from height of uh, 180 feet. Now, so <laughs> if I'm thinking the rocket uh, launching, uh, I'm trying to sketch it, but I cannot sketch it that well. <laughs> so uh, going up, when the rocket is going up, when it launches, I mean, from many pictures that I've seen uh, from the videos of uh, rocket launching and all these other things. When they launch, they have, they shoot out a lot of force with the fuel. And then from zero, it's sl slowly, velocity, initial velocity was zero and then slowly goes up and then just shoots out very quickly. That was the ima uh, image of the rocket launching that I know. And in this case, that's not the case because first of all, launching, rocket launching that we know of is that there's a, a some sort of fuel is burning and then rocket is shooting upward, going like that. <laughs> but uh, there is no force after time t is equal to zero. So that, that means rocket was already moving at 96, for, uh, 96 feet per second. So in fact, launching probably took place before that, not at height of 180 feet per second. So to be realistic, because that's the one of the big thing, you know, uh, that going around in math. Um, I mean, this question, this is not so great a uh, choice. Um, it, it's not that valid, actually. And then, but the other uh, two and three was, you know, maximum height of the rocket occurred at three seconds after it launched. Uh, it seemingly, uh, seemingly, it seems to be true. And then, uh, rocket was uh, in the air approximately six uh, seconds before hitting the ground. In fact, uh, this is not valid because it was still up in the air uh, because height was 68. 
uh, at uh, t equal t equals seven, and rocket was above uh, 300 feet for approximately two se two seconds. Okay, they are talking about from uh, t equals two to t equals four, so that makes sense. So the question that they uh, wanted here was, I mean, the answer that they wanted was choice three, but uh, choice one wasn't that great either. So it is quite interesting how even just you know one topic of the projectile motion. Uh, you know how some questions can be nice questions uh, in terms of pure calculation sake, but when we're looking at the context of the question, it didn't quite make sense. Uh, yeah, but it was uh, it was it was fun, and then <laughs> it was a little bit interesting. Now let's look at the next one together. Next one is the waves. Now uh, wave was actually a uh, uh, quite a uh, nice example. It was examples of uh, sinusoidal uh, graphs, you know, sine function or cosine functions of sort. And then it uh, does come out in algebra too. So let's look at a couple of examples first and then see what happens here. Uh, I mean, background is that we know uh, that in math, uh, y equals a sine of bx plus c. I didn't put down the horizontal uh, uh, shift, but yet uh, given that amplitude is equal to you know absolute value of a goes up and down that's okay frequency is b that's what we say in math class meaning number of cycles within two pi now that's actually not the case in physics frequency is number of cycles in one second and then unit is hertz so how many times the uh, wave repeats itself the, you know, cycles repeat itself in one second. So we can describe the exactly same uh, uh, equation, but yet the way we read off the frequency in terms of uh, in math class versus in physics class would be a little bit different. Now, period, therefore, is a little bit different uh, too, uh, because period in uh, math class is a duration of the uh, a duration to complete one cycle. That's okay in uh, math versus physics, but the formula, so-called, because of the uh, how frequency was defined a little bit differently, is that period we normally write it as two pi over b, which is b is the uh, frequency uh, in math class or coefficient of x. Now, on the other hand, in this case, a period will be duration of uh, duration to complete one cycle, which is okay, and then um, it will be one over frequency. Uh, so, to find the period, that's a little bit different. Now, so then in this case, if you're to look at uh, physics perspective of the uh, uh, frequency and then period, then usually equations can be written in this way. Y equals A. In case of amplitude, we don't have any issue. Uh, but the frequency uh, will be uh, in front of X along with 2 pi. So 2 pi F will be the... Uh, uh, way we uh, write it in physics classes. All right, now then let's look at one example here. Uh, the voltage used by most households can be modeled by the sine function, which is true because we get AC alternating current and then they, uh, you know, they tend to follow the uh, sine function curve here. So now, uh, maximum voltage is 120 volts, okay? So, I mean, it was meant to be in particular. Now, we'll just, we'll just move on here. And there are 60 cycles every second. That means 60 hertz, which is true in US and the many parts of the world. Uh, in, in Europe, I hear that they use the 50 cycles, 50 hertz. Uh, which equation best represents the value of the voltage as it flows through the electric uh, wire, uh, where T is the time in seconds? Now. So basically what they wanted to say in this question, this is uh, June 2016 Algebra 2 exam, is that amplitude is 120. So if I have a curve right over here, amplitude, how high it's going up and down is 120. That's basically what the question wanted to say. Because yes, we do use 120 volts, in our house, in my house, we, we use 120 volts. In many places, we use 120 volts. So that's basically, I think, what the writer was thinking about. And then 60 cycles, that is, in fact, true. Because we, uh, uh, when Tesla was looking at the, uh, uh, or, or, or delivering the current, uh, using the AC current, and then he decided to go for uh, 60, 
uh, cycles every second. So that portion is true. Now, that means uh, what is the equation of the uh, uh, waves? Okay, so, 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 so we understand the question. What they wanted to do was this, in, in case of frequency, yes, uh, 60 cycles per one second. But in math class, what we have to do is, as we realize that uh, our uh, reference of the uh, frequency is 2 pi, so we just multiply by 2 pi, so the number that which we have to put in is 120 pi in front of x, or in front of t in this case, for that matter. So therefore, uh, our answer that which we are looking at is this one. And you can see that this describes the same phenomenon, 60, cy 60 cycles every second, or 120 pi frequencies per 2 pi. Uh, but yeah, even though we're talking about the same thing, this perspective is a little bit different, and the way we uh, code the frequencies is different, even though it's the same uh, equations. Now, so that is true uh, based upon uh, the question. Uh, but, but actually, it's, uh, one thing that was a little bit uh, not so great on this question was uh, that the, uh, in fact, <laughs> when we get 120 volts uh, in, uh, in our house, uh, the maximum uh, voltage is about 170 uh, because they use the uh, RMS, uh, root mean square, uh, meaning because uh, basically what, what, we end up, what we end up doing in this case is this, basically this is the idea of average value uh, theorem uh, from the uh, uh, from the calculus classes. So basically, since we have a positive and negative, what, what they like to do is they like to get the function of the uh, voltage to eliminate the positive and negative, which uh, you know undo each other. So what we end up doing is we square them, and then we gather them uh, from uh, you know uh, zero through a you know particular time, and then and then dt. But we take the square root of it. Uh, so the reason why we take the square root of it is actually square root is outside, sorry. Uh, because we squared uh, the uh, what you call it uh, all the values here. And then of course we divide by a minus b as well. Uh, I mean a minus zero as well. So now in this case, basically what they're doing is uh, uh, we're trying to get the average value of the uh, uh, voltage. And then that average value comes out to 120. So in order for you to have 120 voltage, in fact, the maximum is about 170. So uh, it was a nice question. You even got this frequency correct, actually, based on US. Uh, but the maximum wasn't actually 120, but it should have been 170. Then it would have been an even better question. You know, uh, uh, make uh, many people realize, that, oh, yeah, maximum. Voltage, in fact, at at uh, at, at a, um, you know waves is actually 170, about uh, not 120. You know, 120 is the average uh, voltage. Uh, but it was actually you know quite fun question for us to look at. Now, next one is this: uh, sine function uh, increasing uh, through the origin uh, uh, can be used uh, used to model uh, uh, light waves. So in this case, so light is also uh, has a wave uh, characteristic, and then violet light has a wavelength of 40 uh, nanometers. So I was wondering, okay, violet light, I mean, color can be, as you can see on the bottom, uh, yeah, uh, rainbow, it can be anything you want it to be. And when it says 40 nanometers, so I understand uh, that from math perspective, wavelength, meaning it takes 40 nanometers to complete it. So here we get, this would be zero, and then this is 400 nanometers. So then in the middle will be 200. And then uh, decreasing only, so what they are looking for is when is that coming from here to here? That's basically what we're looking for. So then this is 200, this is 100, and this is 300. So from just purely describing the uh, uh, interval, yes, it is from 100 to 300. But I was curious, what kind of color uh, would you see? Uh, if it's a 400 nanometers, it says violet, but you know, it can be a little bit different. So I went uh, to Google search, uh, and then the word that I uh, put it was wavelength to color. Then it brings me to the website. Uh, you can do that uh, later, or even now, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you can Google it, a uh, wavelength to color. Uh, then it allows you to put the uh, uh, wavelength of a color, and then it shows the color that 
uh, you get. And then this is actually uh, it's a sample of color when I typed in a uh, 400 nanometers. Uh, and then it was, yes, violet color. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of cool for us to visualize what the question was actually talking about here. All right. Now, then let's look at the next uh, example here. So uh, function, uh, as you can see, f of x is equal to 2 to the negative uh, 0.25x times sine of pi over 2x. So this represents damped sound wave, uh, wave function. Of course, in this case, damped, damping basically in physics means loss of energy in oscillating systems. So as you can see, sound waves is going up and down, and then uh, energy is getting uh, you know, smaller and smaller. And in this case, basically what they wanted to see was average value of change. Um, but, but in this case, what we end up getting is this. So energy is being, uh, uh, if, when, when, uh, when the sound loses its energy, what happens? It happens to be that the sound becomes quieter. <laughs> yes, the volume of the sound goes down as the uh, 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 amplitude of the sound goes down. So it's kind of you know, fun to relate uh, between the uh, you know, mathematical uh, equation and then the physics perspective a little bit. It was kind of nice. <laughs> All right. Now, so next concept that I'd like to share with you is uh, heali uh, heating and cooling. Uh, and this actually is, you know, is, is the application of exponential and logarithmic functions. It does come out in Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and then also in calculus class as well, yes. Uh, and then actually I'm going to share one question each from each, uh, of, the, each of the three uh, uh, classes. So background is this, the, uh, the rate of heat loss in uh, uh, cooling, according to Newton's law of cooling, is that directly proportional to the difference in temperatures between the uh, difference in temperature of the body of the object and then its surrounding. So meaning, uh, it makes sense because bigger the temperature difference it is, quicker the object will lose the heat, you know. Uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, you, can, you can easily see that when we have hot coffee in hot day, you will still be hot for a long time. While if you have hot coffee in very, very cold day, when you go outside, you know, the hot coffee gets colder rather quickly. So now, uh, based upon that, this is the you know, two uh, differential equations which we can set up here. And I like to focus on the second one. You see how the temperature changes. Uh, the rate of the temperature changes is the temperature at that time, my, uh, difference between temperature at the time and then uh, temperature of the environment, you know, surrounding, times the coefficient, heat loss coefficient. Uh, and that will be the uh, rate of the temperature change at the time. But in fact, this is a separable different differential equations in terms of T. So what we can easily do is that we can uh, divide by this expressions in both part of the equation and then multiply by dt, then we end up getting separating the uh, uh, variables here. And then once you solve it, then you get to have, and yeah, of course you will have natural logarithm and then raise each side by the, uh, uh, from the base of e, then we get to have this equation. Temperature at the time is the uh, temperature of the time, uh, or, uh, environment plus the difference between those two. Now, so in other words, if you, uh, let me go for the earlier picture. If the, if everything is, uh, if an object is very high, and then if you just let it sit in the uh, temperature of the 30 degrees, then it will come down and then you will later on stay at 30 degrees. And what if you have to be colder, then it's gonna gain heat as it goes along, and then it's going to heat, uh, stay near the 30 degrees Celsius. Now, I mean, which kind of makes sense? So now, uh, let's look at the first question here. This is this is from algebra to sampler. Now, after uh, uh, sitting out of the refrigerator for a while, and then it talks about uh, turkey at the uh, room temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit is placed in the oven at 8 a.m. and then goes on. Now, it, it does mention about the Newton's law of heating, and then it does correctly gives, uh, gives the formula, and then talks about, you know, rest of them, which we have to calculate, so which was kind of nice. Uh, it was a good uh, uh, way for us to connect between the math and physics, you know, and it, uh, because I hear uh, that uh, in other parts of the world, uh, physics is actually part of the uh, 
uh, applied math uh, mathematics department, uh, not part of the science. But anyways, that's a uh, <laughs> uh, uh, talk for another time. But anyways, yes, but it does make a nice connection between math and its application here. Now, this was actually an uh, AP question, uh, AP Calculus BC number four uh, from this year, 2017. Yes, and then, uh, in fact, as you can see, this equation that we see over here, dh over dt, uh, where I believe that h is the temperature. Uh, now, and then, I'm measuring degrees in Celsius, and the initial uh, temperature was 91, and then, as you can see, the rate of the change of the temperature is, in fact, uh, uh, measured by the difference between the temperature at the time and then 27, which is the uh, temperature that's uh, uh, temperature of the environment at the time. So if you actually solve this one by differential equations, uh, then you actually end up getting equation that looks like this. And then once again, this was actually uh, from calculus class, uh, which was talking about uh, cooling, uh, and then it does actually use the Newton's law of cooling here. Yeah, it was very nice. Now, third one. This was actually from Algebra 1, so they wanted to relate this one to exponential function, and then uh, when you look at this equation in itself, we, you know, we, our calculator uh, cannot use the exponential regression to just come up with the uh, format that fits this one, unless this uh, environment is equal to zero. zero. So what I have done was this. This is question number 17 from August 2016 of Algebra 1. The table below shows the temperature T of M of the cup of hot chocolate uh, that is allowed to chill over several minutes M. So here, these are the minutes and then there's a temperature that goes down. Which expression best fits the data for T of M? Now, what the question wanted us to do was that... Uh, this was initial condition, so 150, as you can see in the beginning. And then the value is going down little by little. So that means only, only thing that's possible is choice 1 or choice 3. But given that when m is equal to 0, we suppose get 150. So therefore, only thing that's possible is choice 1. And then you can actually uh, see that each time it's going down by about 85%. I mean, going down by 15%, hence 85 is the base of the exponential function. Now, so uh, what I have done was this. I was looking at the, these values, and then I was curious, even though uh, the question was uh, exponential function, and then, you know, we were able to answer that at all. I mean, you know, we were able to answer all those things, but uh, how does this data fit into uh, Newton's law of cooling? Because I know the initial value, which is 150. So in fact, we end up, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, several different conditions that I can plug into T and then, you know, uh, the small T and then a capital T time and then the temperature uh, with two unknowns. First unknown is the uh, temperature of the environment and second one is the coefficient R. So I have two unknowns. I have many different conditions. It's okay. So what I have done was I set it up the uh, uh, system of equation between these two conditions. It didn't come out exactly the same, of course, each time, but it came out around uh, R was about uh, each time R was come, uh, R was around uh, 1.63 ish, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and then uh, time. I mean, the temperature of the environment was came out. Sometimes it was low positive number. Sometimes it was you know uh, uh, very close to uh, negative uh, zero, uh, the negative values. But it was about zero. So I was thinking, okay, if I have to plug in zero in place of temperature of the environment. And then, uh, if coefficient was uh, 0.163 over here, then we will end up getting, interestingly, uh, something very similar to uh, approximately equal to 150 times 0.85 to the t power. And that's basically what we end up getting over here. Now, uh, so, so uh, from that uh, kind of like, you know, feeding the data into the uh, equations, we, we realize that this, uh, condition seems to be possible if the uh, temperature of the environment is zero degrees. I'm just hoping that it's not Kelvin. <laughs> it's just us. Uh, it's just us over out there, right? I guess. Then we can taste these things. All right. So uh, it was. Uh, we wanted to examine a few uh, 
problems like these. And then uh, there are other uh, physics concepts that were involved in um, math problems. Uh, Lenz equation, uh, it was fractional equation, obviously, right? Bohr's law, and then inverse proportion, and all total resistance in parallel circuits. Uh, this came out in algebra 2 and trig a long time ago as well. So there are many other concepts that uh, comes up, but I thought uh, this would be a good, you know, starting point for us, for, uh, for us as math teachers to look at some physics concepts behind our math problems and then uh, uh, see the making the connections instead of just, you know, distancing ourselves uh, from the context of the problems. But it, was, it would have been a great opportunity, a great beginning for us to see the, uh, see the connections between them because, uh, after all, physics is only applied mathematics. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.